I just want to introduce our speaker, Paul Bloom. So, Paul has been my colleague for three years. In that time, I just want to admire him more and more and more. So he began by doing sort of very technical work in language acquisition. And then over time, he really expanded his research. So he's did subsequent work that questions about art, about essentialism, about pleasure, in his most recent book. And today, we'll be talking about morality. At the same time, I think one thing that's really notable about Paul is not just the work he's done, but his research. So the sort of wisdom and compassion that he shows always in talking with, with students and with um, other faculty members in the department. And I guess his real rock star status was brought home to me recently when I was in a cafe. And I was noticing that the person next to me was trying to pick up a, a girl using, by sort of demonstrating his knowledge of sort of the intellectual world. And being sort of intellectual myself, I was wondering, so who is he going to talk about? Is he going to be talking about James Joyce, about Cruz? about Kafka, about Nietzsche, and the answer was Paul Bloom. <laughs> so yeah, it's Paul. Or even 
and other babies in silent distress. We know as well that early on, this uh, engine of the pain of others, the suffering of others, can elicit empathetic positive responses. Uh, babies and young children will soothe one another, they'll, they'll share, and so on. And at some point, these moral motivations become connected with the capacity for moral judgment, the ability to assess the morality of others, and also to assess the morality of one's own actions. And my favorite example is actually from Darwin. So Darwin um, published in the, in the Philosophy Journal Mind uh, a, a diary of his own child, William, uh, whose nickname was Dottie, looking at the, the development of the mental life of William. And at one point, he talks about, he describes, well, this case, when two years and three months old, he gave his last bit of gingerbread to his little sister, and then cried out with high self approbation Oh, kind guy, kind guy. <laughs> um, Darwin described this in a section he entitled The Moral Sense. And here he was drawing upon that the, the work of Adam Smith and his contemporaries, and David Francis Hutchinson, who's Adam Smith's advisor, who argued that in addition to moral motivations, we also have a moral sense. The moral sense isn't something that directs us to be good, good or bad. The moral sense is actually akin to a perceptual sense, allowing us to evaluate the actions of other, ourselves and others as good or bad. And this is something which I've been studying um, with my collaborators at Yale, uh, starting with uh, Cameron and Harley Cameron. We've been looking at the emergence of this moral sense in babies and young children. So, um, so in our first set of studies, which was published in Nature about five years ago, what we did was we showed babies um, uh, interactions where somebody would be struggling to get up a hill. And we used, for various reasons, we didn't use people, we used geometrical little objects, struggling to get up a hill. One character would help it, and the other character would hinder it. And the question we were interested in is, uh, would babies prefer the one that helped it over the one that hindered it? So it'll give you a sense of what babies see. negativity 
emerges earlier than the sensitivity to positivity, and I can discuss that later on. Um, this experiment, we, we've done various extensions and controls for this experiment, but there's a perfectly reasonable point people raise when present this, which is you can't rely too much on this hill climbing method. You know, maybe there's something else going on here that's really strange, and you fail to control for it. So what we've done over the last few years is we, we replicated the same sort of pattern of findings, but with different social actions than they go. So for time reasons, I won't go over this, but I'll just give you one example of something which, which was a study we did with five month olds. And I'll let you choose who's a good guy and a bad guy. Adults, and this is what I want to walk through a bit. 
So the first study along this line, wonderful set of studies, studies by Eric Schreier and his colleagues, um, brought kids, did some kids in Switzerland, and they were playing for candies, which are Swiss candies, which are good. Um, and, and they're told, because the data, I'm not saying they're told they're playing with another child who comes from the same neighborhood that they'll never see again, they'll never see again. So, you know, it was anonymous interaction, as I understand. And in the first game they play, it's basically what, what they call it, a dictator game, what they call it a sharing game. And I want to make sure you want to, the notation is going to be important for what I'm talking about. So the option is the child can either, the option the child's option is either keeping one for himself and giving one to this anonymous stranger, that's one one, or keeping two for himself and giving nothing to this anonymous stranger, that's two zero. And what they find is, the seven and eight year olds are somewhat generous half the time they will share this candy with an honest stranger. But the five to six year olds aren't generous at all. The three to four year olds, not. Basically, this is indistinguishable from random error. Um, now, you might say, well, they, they, know, they know what the right thing to do is. They, it's irresistible for a kid this age to grab all the So, they did another thing called the pro social game. And here, the child has the option of giving one for himself, giving one to another person, versus giving, giving one to himself and giving nothing. To another person. So here you're giving, you, you have the option of, of giving to somebody else at no cost to yourself. The seven and eight year olds would. The younger children were rarely above chance. A more recent study um, was done looking at one and two year olds asking basically the same question. And so they used a different design. They used a design that was actually based on previous work done with chimpanzees um, asking the same question. The child is to choose one of two levers. These are crackers here. An experimenter sits here. If the child pulls on this lever, she gets one crack and the experimenter gets nothing. That's one zero. If she chooses this, she gets one, and the experimenter gets one as well. They found that children were surprisingly callous to the presence of the experimenter. Um, the, the two year old only pulled this slightly above chance. If the experimenter said, I want a cracker, I want a cracker. Um, and if she said nothing, they did 50 50. And the one year old didn't even care if the experiment was taken for a cracker. <laughs> um, in collaboration with Mark Cheskin and Karen Wynn, we've been looking at playing these games with older children, looking at their sort of um, uh, intuitions on, on similar things. So here, here's our design. What we do is we tell children, look, here, these are tokens. And these tokens you get at the end, you can, you can use the tokens to buy these attractive toys and show them the toys. Now, um, you get to choose the distribution of tokens. And you get to choose how much you get and how much another person gets. The other person is somebody going to come into the laboratory tomorrow. Never going to meet you. You'll, you'll, she'll never know it was you, and you'll never meet her. You get to choose how much you get and how much she gets. So the option, the way options are laid out, you can choose the shot either green or blue. If she chooses the screen, she gets one, and the other person gets one. If she chooses the blue, she gets two, and the other person gets three. That's just the that. So we run it with different comparisons. Um, so one comparison is one, one versus two, two. The child gets one, the other child gets one, the child gets two, versus the other child gets two. Then we find kids choose two, two. They're, they're not companies. Two, two is both more greedy, they get more. And more generous, the other person gets more. It's a no brainer. But here's some more interesting contrasts. 1, 1 versus 2, 3, 1, 0 versus 2, 2. Now you'll notice that at, at first blush, the second option seems nicer, no matter how you slice it, because the child himself gets more uh, 2 versus 1 in both cases, and the other child gets more. It seems to maximize everything. But some of you may be noticing something else about this, which is by giving the second choice in this option, your, um, you, the other child is a relative advantage for you. And by choosing the second choice in this object, you are giving up a relative advantage over a child. Now, this is not a child you're ever going to see again. But that plays a role. Children tend to be at around, children between five and seven, and I think younger than five, tend to choose this object. Apparently motivated to give up resources so that they don't, um, so that they don't, they preserve or get a relative advantage over a stranger. Um, this writing was motivated by some work published immediately before by Peter Blake and Captain McCulloch, who used a very clever design where a child got to distribute resources to another child. This is the playground. And so I had choice either to distribute resources or to destroy them. They were candy. So the child either press one lever and everybody gets candy, or press another lever and the candy goes into a garbage. Um, in some cases, the options were the child himself gets four, and 
the other child that you want versus the short child. So almost always get this. But this is that when the child gets one and the other child gets four, there, up until the age seven, children would have chosen to destroy this division rather than getting relatively less. I once presented a preliminary version of this finding to a, to a Jewish group uh, at Yale, uh, and, and, and somebody pointed out afterwards that there's a Jewish folk tale that precisely parallels this, where the idea is there's a very envious man, and an angel comes to earth and says, I will give you anything you want, but your neighbor will get double. And the envious man thought for a moment and said, I want to have all my eyes plucked out. And I think that captures natural. <laughs> um, um, I, I kind of like the way actually King's the Amos put it, where you know, it's no wonder that people are so horrible when they start their life as children. <laughs> but now, now I want to get to the puzzle. So I've talked about motivations, one kind of motivations in, 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 in children. But to see now judgments, the data on judgments is very interesting. And I think it as a rather strikingly different story. What we find here is an equality bias. For judgments of third party interaction, that is, interaction the child himself does not benefit from. So, William Damon was the first to point this out. He had an extensive interview study with older children where he asked them, um, uh, you know, okay, you have 10 pennies, how are you distributed among two children? And these children are obsessed with equality, overriding, the young people overriding any other consideration like need, prior effort. The even split seemed to exert a powerful pull on them. Um, more recently at Yale, uh, Christina Olson and the graduates from Alex Shaw has, has done a similar finding. She tested um, uh, high, high, high SES wealthy American children and four South African children. And these were children between, uh, between five and eight. And what they were told is that two children just completed the task. And you can now get to reward them with different things. And here's what children are told. You get to decide how many erasers Mark and Dad will get. We have these five erasers. We have one for Mark, one for Dad, one for Mark, one for Dad. Uh-oh, we have one left over. Question is, shall I give one to Dan or shall I throw it away? Children almost always choose to throw it away. And then you have control conditions. Maybe they just like throwing things away. But if there's two erasers left over, and then you say, okay, should we give one of these to Dan and one to Mark and throw the book away? You never want to throw them away. And this suggests this powerful equality. But the blind by the way, holds when it's perfectly explicit that these erasers are sent to Mark and Dan, and they never burn the other one. So it's not merely simple as anticipated ending. Uh, Olson and Selke replicated a similar finding showing an, an equality bias uh, in three-year-olds when they're distributing items to dolls. And more recently, a set of experimenters has been extending these methods to babies looking both at expectancies and judgments. So a very nice study by Marco Schmidt and Justin Somerville showed children cases where a character would either distribute an even number of items to two individuals or an uneven number of items. And they found that the children of this age, 15 month olds, would look longer at this array indicating surprise than this array. And they had a suitable control. So for instance, if there's no purposeful division to people, there's no looking time difference. It's not an uneven array, it's just to capture your eye more. This was also replicated by a Stephanie Sloan and her colleagues with slightly older babies, uh, 18 month olds, using a slightly different method, but finding the same thing, an expectation of equal division. And the study, which seems to, I think, to wrap it up, is a nice study by, seriously, by Baraki and Serving, who tested one year olds, and showed the cases where a character would distribute things evenly, sort of bear would get one ball to this and one ball to this or unevenly, the line we have nothing here and nothing here. And then, similar to what we did in the Hamlin studies, uh, ask babies to choose which character they like the most. And they found babies like the even divided. So, you see here is a bit of a puzzle. Because children seem to expect a 1-1 one, one division over a 2-0 division, and they prefer individuals that do 1-1 one, one over 2-0. And when they themselves are in charge, they prefer other individuals, they do 1-1 one, one versus 2-0. But when they are just choosing for themselves, they'll choose to zero. And so how do you explain this? Well, there's at least two alternatives. One alternative is probably the obvious one that's occurred to people, which is the spirit's moving flesh. So, so in other words, children know uh, that they should choose this when they themselves are involved in this situation, but they can resist choosing it. They like getting more. 
in our cases like they were more chesting, they like the relative advantage. They know it's wrong. And when judge asks about somebody else, they say it's wrong. But they just can't help themselves. I don't doubt that this is part of the story as to what happens. It has to be what happens. Certainly for adults, there's a huge asymmetry between what we know and what we actually do. But I don't think it's the entire story. And my only argument is not the entire story, it's somewhat anecdotal. I've watched many children perform in these games. I've watched videos of them, I've spoken to people done these studies. And what you find is no sign of guilt, shame, and anxiety, even if they're being filmed, even if their parents are by their side. They seem to say, oh, I'll take, I'll take it all. And they don't seem to, to have any sense that they're doing anything wrong. It's, it's, it's anecdotal that needs to be nailed down. But I think it's worthwhile searching for another alternative. Another alternative is that we possess different systems for the evaluation of others and the evaluation of self. These systems may have different properties, different evolutionary histories, different functions. Uh, and one notable difference is uh, the moral evaluation of others is, is, is broader than the moral evaluation of self. It applies, applies to a broader scope of actions. And what happens in development, what happens at least in our, in our society between roughly the ages of 5 and 10, is that this expands different networks for that. Um, and then the question is what motivates the convergence? And, and I think there's a couple of possibilities. One is that, that in order to justify your own actions and challenge the actions of others, you would have to appeal to, to roughly impartial rules. And this is a point, again, David Hume made. He said, if you're going to criticize something, you know, stop doing that. that that's wrong. You need to, somebody to do that. He must depart from his private and particular situations and must choose a point of view common to him and others. Um, another possibility is we simply possess an impartial code of moral judgment. That is, we possess rules like divide things evenly or no hitting. That simply don't specify who they apply to, they apply to everybody. These are, of course, not entirely independent proposals. So, for instance, in, the, in this book, The Expanding Circle, Peter Singer speculates on the origin of impartial rules and argues that basically this need to, to work together in a community to justify oneself. Um, is the force that leads to the emergence of uh, impartial morality within the culture. Well, I've talked so far about different moral case studies, um, including uh, uh, our response to helping and hindering our pro social and anti social actions, empathetic responses, and intuitions about fairness. But we, we've long known and that, that this is an incomplete picture uh, of, of morality. Um, and the people who, who one, one aspect of morality which I find particularly interesting. Uh, was, was a topic of Leanne's talk yesterday, was focused on by Rich Slater and Jonathan Haidt. And this involves sort of the purity slash disgust domain. Um, and so, for instance, one, people always give the example of, uh, of consensual adult incest, but for those of us who get tired of philosophical examples, it so happens, fortunately enough, there's a real case of consensual adult incest uh, in Manhattan. Uh, so, um, so a Columbia professor was charged with uh, second degree criminal incest. Uh, I don't know if second degree, first degree, third degree, really. <laughs> but but, um, but for, for having apparently a, a sexual relationship with his uh, adult daughter. And this led to moral approbation, as you can tell from the New York Post uh, uh, cover. Um, uh, consider uh, consensual same sex relationships, uh, marriages, but also simply sexual intercourse between people same the sex. Um, this is in many parts of the world, but many times deeply disapproved of, and it's deeply disapproved of today by many, many people. The most recent extensive survey I have in the United States was done by the University of Chicago, where he simply asked people about sexual relations between two, two, sexual relations between two adults of the same sex, and they had to mark off, is it totally okay, totally, or always wrong? 44% said it was always wrong. Now, as you can imagine, by the way, there's a huge age effect. The older you are, you're far more likely to say that's always wrong than younger. But still, a powerful number of people. <coughs> then there's more generally the prohibitions against lewd behavior, promiscuity, irresponsibility, um, all summed up, I think, in here's the <laughs> Now, Now, this connects to what Richard Schwader described as, as the ethics of divinity, uh, sacred order, sanctity, uh, sacred order, natural order, tradition. And, and it connects to a distinctive emotion that of disgust. So, disgust, and this is the work largely of John Hyde and Paul Ross and, and many others, disgust is in general, it's a human universal. It has a, if you believe in basic emotions, it's a basic emotion, it's a basic characteristic facial expression. 
And it tends to be elicited by animals and animals. So wherever you go, these things will be discussed. Meat tincture and blood on it. Rotten flesh mostly. And one theory, although the details vary somewhat, is that the scuts is an evolutionary adaptation. It's evolved to motivate avoidance of parasites and poisons. The interesting fact about the scuts, which is why it comes up in this context, is that it can apply to people. So Darwin, who's always a keen observer of his own reactions and reactions of others, that gives a nice example of this. In Tierra del Fuego, they had a touch with the fingers and cold preserved meat, and plainly showed disgust with the softness. Whilst I thought other disgusts might be being touched by a naked savage, those camps did not appear to me. Um, we know that, that, that disgust can elicit, um, so people are disgusting. Now people are disgusting perhaps, because people produce all of the, the waste products and things that we are that are primary objects of discussion. Perhaps people are disgusting and people carry disease and parasites. But when you look at the list what's disgusting, people are always very high up. People are strong disgust elicitors. And disgust motivates avoidance. And in modern creatures like us, in moral creatures like us, this avoidance transforms into uh, into uh, anger at individuals. Shake the eight ball, the object rotates. 
If you look at the other side of the eight ball, and it's through a window, it gives an answer to life's most important questions. Now, to enter, uh, we make a, a speculation. This is the brain. Imagine that in part of the brain, the insula, perhaps. Um, <laughs> You know, this is so exciting for me to do neuroscience. <laughs> Imagine there's a magic eight ball. And what happens is when faced with a moral dilemma, our heads jiggle slightly, the thing rotates, and a sensor looks at the result of the eight ball, and then that dictates our moral judgment. Now, presumably, if that were to happen, nobody could coherently say that it expresses the wisdom, because it's random. Um, now, I'm not saying that these reactions are random, they certainly are not. But I am saying that just as in the magic eight ball, there are more to things that we typically view as, as expressing moral values. Um, and there's two arguments for it. One is that that one argument, everybody accepts that, historically this has had a morally bad reputation. Um, Martin Nussbaum sums up that disgust properties, sickness, smell, bad smell, uh, decay, foulness, have been associated with all sorts of people who are imagining this tainted by the earth's body. And every genocidal movement that we know of has used the rhetoric of discussion to persuade people that some group of people are not people, that they are that they are, are morally hideous and, and deserve to be killed. Now, one could respond by saying, okay, discuss sometimes gets it wrong. Everything sometimes gets it wrong. There are failures in empathy, there are failures of reasoning, there are failures of logic. But my point is a bit more general than that. It's not merely that it gets it wrong, but rather there's no distinction that I know of of uh, cases where disgust gets it wrong in a way that we have to acknowledge to be wrong. Um, and those that, that are the cases that we want to use disgust to rely upon. So to put it a little bit more, more artfully, um, some people want to say, uh, and have made arguments, that, that, that we should be suspicious of gay matters because it disgusts many of us. But if it's true, and I think it is true, that this is psychologically no different from our response to interracial marriage, which once disgusted many of us and thought we were wrong for that reason, there's no reason to see disgust as a reliable indicator. And in fact, um, I think there's a reason why it isn't a reliable indicator, which is the one I just said, which is it has evolved to motivate avoidance of parasites and poisons. It hasn't been evolved to be a response to anything that we do as moral goods. Now, contrast it with these cases. Now, the issues here are complicated and speculative, but I think one could make a good case that these, in fact, have evolved to solve the problem of self-interested individuals living in small communities. And I want to be, for purposes here, agnostic when I say evolved as to whether it's evolved over the course of biological evolution or evolved over the course of cultural evolution. I think that should be, may differ depending on what phenomenon you look at. But consider the norm of equal division. If there are four things in front of me, and four in front of me and in front of you, I would really want to get all four. Um, and you would really want to get all four. Neither one of us is as happy as you get. If I get two, you get two. But it's a terrific solution. It is much better than battling out for the four. And one of us suffering the pain of getting not The fear that the norm of equal division is, is in some ways a brilliant solution to the problem of distributing things. Or take no hit. I really like to hit people. Um, I would love a world where I could get hit people whenever I want to. But I would really hate a world where anybody could get hit me. In fact, I would hate that world where everybody got to hit me more than I would love the world where I got to hit people. And in fact, the no hitting rule, I think, since I think most rational individuals feel the same, the no hitting rule is a very smart solution to the problem of getting along in a society. And I think in that sense, because these things have been evolved in ways that are sensitive to individuals' needs, their reproductive needs, their, their needs to survive and prosper, um, it, it is one to make an argument that they actually do express some sort of deep wisdom. Now, I don't expect this argument to convince a moral nihilist. It should. If you don't believe there's such a thing as morality, if when I say, oh, it's so good to maximize pleasure and use pain, I get people satisfied, they're just, and you say, I don't care about that at all, none of this will convince you that any moral judgment is a moral eight ball, and because there's nothing for it to be more to. But most people assume there are certain values worth, worth uh, maximize. And, people, and many people assume that when we talk about a moral choice and morality, we're talking about maximizing certain values over others. Say, you know, pleasure over pain, you know, dignity over humiliation, and so on and so forth. If that's the case, then I think we can learn something from the scientific study of the nature and origin 
uh, our moral beliefs and our moral thoughts. I think in that regard, moral psychology can help tell us what intuitions are worth taking seriously. And I'll end with that. Thank you. It is just to, to argue that to say it's disgusting is itself not, not a good argument. 
And so, so this doesn't actually answer any more of the problems, but it does is it bears on sort of ways that people come come across uh, answers to normal problems. The other thing is, I don't doubt that to be disgusted is is wrong. So there's sort of an important distinction there. If I'm doing something that disgusts you, then you can say to me, you're being a jerk, why are you doing this to me? And and then and, and that's just plain old harm psychology. But it's not saying that disgust per se is morally wrong. It's rather disgust or, or blatant sexual behavior and so on is 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 um is can can upset people and you shouldn't upset people or think people you don't have to. that's just normal normal psychology. I think by the way a lot of the hard debates and sort of public policy um, turn around this sort of thing. And I don't think moral psychology helps. So for instance, if I do something publicly that is very offensive to you, like I draw a, a, a cartoon of Muhammad, or I have a gay rights display, or, or I do one of a million, I have sex in public, whatever. Um, that really bothers you. To what extent is your being bothered? A good reason to go to my behavior. That's not a cycle, that's not a question for somebody like me. But anyway, disgust can be a harm, but that's different than saying it's wrong. Your case against taking the disgust seriously was based on um, discovering that uh, people's disgust responses can be triggered or suppressed um, by kind of irrelevant circumstances. And I was wondering whether anybody has studied whether people's um, pro-egalitarianism, anti-inequality responses can be triggered or suppressed by irrelevant circumstances? Yeah, um, the answer is I, certainly yes, of course. So for everything, um, you can, you know, psychologists, this is what psychologists do for a living. They take some sort of reaction people get and say, I can prime it. Um, so empathy is the class of the So how much money do you want to give to a starving child to easily be influenced by showing you a picture of her? We're giving you her name. That's so rational because why did why of course she has a name. Why telling it to why should that make a difference? Um, you can make people more you can make children more egalitarian by before giving them a task, show them pictures of people standing next to each other. You just show them the picture over and over again. And then that motivates a more egalitarian mindset. So my claim wasn't actual, and I should have known I appreciate this. When I gave the experimental evidence, that was just experimental evidence supporting the idea that being disgusted can lead to moral disapproval and, 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 and pushing people away. It wasn't in and of itself an argument. That was not my argument against using disgust as having moral reports. Because as you point out, I could have made the same thing with regards to take empathy, which I think really should be taken seriously. Does that help? Um, so was there supposed to be an argument against taking disgust seriously in moral liberation? Yes, there were two arguments. One argument is that disgust is a horrible history. So disgust has led us to moral conclusions that now, as rational beings, uh, we would plan to reject. Nobody defends the Holocaust, or right? so. You say, but you say, but, but there goes. You know, so some, so at least that disgust isn't reliable. And I think it's difficult to find other claims of other aspects of moral intuition. Say, and you can probably find some entities like you straight, but not as much. The second part of the argument is there's a reason why disgust has such a terrible history, which is disgust is not calibrated towards goods that we we as value, we as conscious reasoning we use value. Now the second one, they're both empirical claims. So so again, as I, as I said before, somebody can say, well, you're wrong about disgust. Actually, when you look at disgust, disgust is not just feces and urine and sweating people and, and you know semen and all that. Rather, it's something which gives a value, and that's what it resonates to. So that's an empirical point, and one that I think is much better for it. All right, thanks. When my daughter was uh, two years old, she was taking a bath, and it got very quiet in there. And I went inside to look, and there were these little poop balls, nicely organized on the edge of the tub. No, she wasn't sharing them with me. Okay. <laughs> so clearly, disgust is learned. At least that's my view. That you learn to not like feces and, and the other kinds of things. So the question I have is, uh, what uh, when 
the baby's first exhibit discuss, and is there any, any evidence that it's an ape? Um, good. Um, your, your story, which is, which is a good one, um, <laughs> one I will never forget about it, uh, shows that disgust develops, but it doesn't show its work. Um, what happens is, one of, there are several reasons why it doesn't. It is not work. Between roughly the ages of four and five, humans everywhere began to develop a revulsion to a species, urine, vomit, blood, and rotten meat. Before that, they don't have it. But I think that, these, that the universality of it suggests an un, a, a neural unfolding rather than, than experiential learning. For one thing, many people, many people like, like psychoanalysts and so on have tried to connect to toilet training. But one of the interesting findings, I'll just even shot on there, that one of the interesting findings is that um, toilet training, toilet training society has nothing to do with disgust. As one would expect, toilet training won't explain why we discuss it at all, for instance. So, so I think it shows an unfolding and development. However, discuss must involve some learning because there's some flexibility. And the flexibility is really with food. So if some society people eat bugs or rats, it would gross me out to eat a rat. The very thought is it's not it. That's not universal. So I think the story that a lot of people tell is you have a universal unfolding, a universal capacity, but it has some flexibility, akin to language and other things, that allows you to learn what sort of noxious and dangerous in your local environment. All right, the chapter seventy-seven. What I was thinking is that children, as you're raising them, parents react very strongly to things like children picking up their feces. So there's this tremendous teaching effort, if you would, that's going on. And now you're saying between four and five is when, they're, in a sense, they are able to learn the messages of that teacher. It's, it's, it's a conceivable, it's a very standard social learning theory, which I think should be taken seriously. But what this implies, for instance, is that everybody, everybody here is grossed up by the smell of wine. And it would suggest that the reason why is that for each and every one of us, at one point, there was vomit, we had a, and then our parents went, ooh, ooh, oh, oh, and then somehow, we said, oh, now I'm strongly disgusted by it. So that seems A, implausible, and B, it's not the way social learning works. So when my kid ever plays National Electrical Socket, I scream, oh my god, what are you doing? You know, you could damage the electrical system. <laughs> 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 I, get, I, get very, I get very upset. My kid is not grossed out, phobic, or anything about electrical socket. You know, whatever, that's screaming out. You know? So, yeah, you and my kid is disgusted. Yeah. Here's, the, here's, the, here's the experiment. I bet that if you, if you took a four-year-old, so here's the experiment we're doing. You took a four-year-old, and every time you pass by um, uh, a microphone, you gag. Oh, oh, I gag those festivals. Will your child then, based on this one trial exposure, for the rest of his life, want to wretch whatever it is? <laughs> I think mean, plainly no. And here's another, here's another argument, just by the way. The story of disgust, the learning of disgust, isn't, I mean, your, your suggestion is, is popular and interesting to people study, it, but it isn't that you learn that rats are disgusting and snakes are disgusting and cockroaches and beetles. Rather, it's in development you learn that, um, that what's, what's not disgusting when it comes to meat, and everything else is disgusting by default. So I'm sure, like many people, and many people have shared idea that rat, the idea of eating fried rat is really gross. This is not because people would eat fried rat in front of me and then get grossed out by it. It's rather because nobody ate rats when I was a kid. And so since rats are animals and foods, they trigger this disgust response. There's more to say about this, but it's an interesting issue. Thank you. If the development of disgust is a, a, a developmental phenomenon, and that it unfolds and falls up. Um, is the failure to develop that disgust, smearing feces, playing with vomit, is that associated with other behavioral phenomena, abnormal behavioral phenomena? And would it suggest that it's subserved by some intrinsic uh, neural mechanism? Well, there, there are, I guess, people in general better than I do, distinctive neural signatures of the stuff that's related to insula, I'm told. Um, and, and, and so you can get brain sorts of brain damage from stroke or trauma that actually makes disgust go away.
way. Um, later on, uh, things like smearing one's feces over one's own so it, it, it's obviously reflective of, of mental illness. I, I'm not so much sure the mental illness involves uh, that the disgust reaction goes away any more than self-harm you know, so the pain reaction goes away. But rather, people who are in terrible situations and, and awful emotional states will often do things purposefully that are unpleasant. And as a non-pathological example, it's not as simple as, well, some things are disgusting, so we avoid them. People are complicated. And because disgust is aversive, that makes some disgusting things interesting and fun. They're used as challenges and macho things and TV programs like Fear Factor where, you, where we get pleasure in watching people do disgusting things. So it's complicated in those cases. In some cases, it may actually involve a diminution of disgust. I think that's certainly the case with two and three year olds. So two and three year olds, you don't want to live near their feces because, you know, uh, they don't care. Um, but, but when you get to an older child, it does suggest there's something, you know, as you point out, that's what's going on. Thank you.